So hi, everyone. Uh, before I start my presentation, I just want to say um, it's inc it, it, I'm incredibly thrilled to present my work uh, to all of you, and I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. But before I uh, explain the title of this presentation, uh, I want to do a quick exercise with you all. So think of four features that can distinguish this computer from any other computer in five seconds. So the four features that I immediately thought of were its length, its breadth, its height, and its type, or, or del in this case. However, what would, what would happen uh, if we instead categorize these computers according to multiple, multiple different features? I mean, it's 2016. We know heaps about the computer. So let's look at this. We have a whole bunch of different technical specifications. But now what's our, our big problem? Instead of having too little information, like over there, to distinguish between all the different possible types of computers, now we have too much information. How in the world are we going to choose the best computer from all of those different technical specifications? And I'm sure that um, this may have been a problem that some of you actually uh, have encountered in your daily lives. So, there are just too many features to analyze. And this is an introduction to high dimensional data, where um, because of these features, we are unable to uh, comprehend or, or think in these higher dimensions in order to figure out um, which categories are actually um, which categories are actually relevant. So how do we how do we as humans, uh, as mere mortals, approach this problem? We just take three different features, we select which ones we like. And then we pick our computer. So we, we just simplify this problem completely. And if you picked your cool computer that you love, give yourselves a pat on the back. However, what happens when we actually do have to consider every possible category and feature of, of, these, uh, of these objects? Um, for example, let's go on to a slightly harder problem, and that is drug discovery. So in, 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 this, in this kind of problem, we're trying to find target proteins um, for, for drug development. However, we don't have a good intuition on what sort of features of these proteins actually make them good targets. So what do we do? We try and find outliers, things that don't conform to our scientific knowledge, things that are completely unexpected, because that's what's going to lead us to some kind of new and unexpected finding that's going to lead us to a breakthrough. So our new question is now, how in the world do we choose the best target protein? And it's so similar to the best computer because um, they're dependent on these problems about high dimensional data. So really, how do we find the needle in the 27 dimensional haystack? Well, we could try machine learning. So for example, um, there's a common machine learning algorithm called the K nearest neighbors approach. And what it does is that it, it classifies a point as an outlier based on the distances to its k, or in this case, three nearest neighbors. So you can see the rightmost point, and um, it has very, very long distances between all of its three nearest neighbors, and because of that, it's an outlier. This is great in two dimensions. What happens when we get larger? OK, so imagine we go back to our computer at the store example. And our, we have a new computer. This computer has the greatest processing power in the entire world. However, it's normal in every other respect. The machine learning algorithm that I just described, the k-nearest neighbors algorithm, would essentially average out, um, average out all of the high dimensional distances. And as a result of that, would um, ensure that the distance between the, the high, those high dimensional distances are actually pretty close because they're so because these computers would be similar in so many different categories. As a result, when it comes up with these kind of plots, um, the distances between um, the, uh, the the data the data is so sparse that um, almost every point uh, is is pretty far from everything else. So every point can be considered an outlier with respect to every other point. So this evidently um, has its limits. And it's called the curse of dimensionality for a reason. And as the number of dimensions or features gets higher and higher and higher, 
we um, start to, we, the data becomes more sparse and the machine learning algorithm starts to not work. So what, how can we solve this problem? So the lab that I've been working in uh, focuses on probabilistic modeling and probabilistic computing. And essentially, in, in regular mathematical models, you go from a set of causes to what would happen. For example, if I throw a ball from a particular height, um, what's going to be uh, its displacement at a particular time? So I take the cause, I throw the ball, and I find the effect. Probabilistic models are the exact opposite. They take a certain effect, they take an observed data and some prior knowledge, and they convert that into the data generating process. So if I know something about what happened, what process actually generated the data? That's the interesting question specified by probabilistic models. And in probabilistic models, we model a joint distribution, meaning that we essentially um, uh, model what the, the probabilities of all the variables being different values. So what was the purpose of my project? I attempted to find a probabilistic modeling framework in order to identify and, and explain these outliers in, in this high dimensional data or data with lots and lots and lots of features. How did, how did I do that? Well, first, I identified the dependencies between the variables. Second thing I did was I used a probabilistic model uh, developed at the MIT C at CSAIL um, called CrossCat in order to simulate different values under a probabilistic model for those variables. Then I analyzed errors to find the outliers. And finally, I explained those outliers using predictive probability. And I'm, uh, so we, I need an example in order to demonstrate my case. Something that was clean, uh, something that had uh, extremely, uh, an extremely clear um, piece, uh, extremely clear metric um, from which we could measure. And what's really cleaner and clearer than empty space? So I took the example of finding outlier orbits um, in, of satellites. And I said, can this combination of the two models um, that, that I was investigating actually explain those outlier orbits of satellites without any knowledge about uh, the physical deterministic laws that govern satellites, such as Kepler's law, where the period squared over the average distance cubed is a constant. But our models don't really know that. And they're f trying to find these outlier orbits, the orbits that differ from um, Kepler's law. How do we do that? And how do we show that that can be generalized to lots of other high dimensional data sets? So first of all, we find the dependencies between the variables. This is a heat map here, and it represents um, the, pro um, the probabilities that two different variables are actually dependent on each other. And all the dark regions over there represent a really high probability dependence. And all the light regions represent really low probability dependence. So you can see that um, the variables of perigee, apogee, and period, so perigee and apogee are the minimum and maximum distances um, to the sun, uh, uh, to the, to, from the satellite from the Earth, and they represent, um, and, and they are very, very dependent on each other. Um, so so uh, obviously our model is doing very well. And I compared these uh, pairwise scatter plots and the densities, and I actually found that the model was really good at, at figuring out the, the, the actual law without having any deterministic knowledge. Second thing I did was I sampled from a conditional distribution. So I essentially said, if I know what these two variables are, the perigee and the apogee, what will be the period? And I found that um, the inferred periods um, by, our, by, my by my model were actually really close to the ones from Kepler's law. Then I identified outliers um, using clustering. Using a, I developed a Dirichlet process mixture model in order um, to cluster all those outliers and figure out which ones had the biggest deviation. And once I ident identified all those outliers, I used predictive probabilities, which is the probability that some data occurs under the model, um, in order to distinguish between, say, a data entry error, um, an outlier, like a true outlier, something that differs from Kepler's law, and just some, some noise. And finally, I, I computed like, the similarity to different other satellites in order to propose like, probable hypotheses, some explanations for this. And what I was able to find was that I detected five out of the six outlier orbits from manual research um, using those combination of the two models. And the six was a potential outlier. And the framework was able to actually figure out what Kepler's law was without having any deterministic knowledge. And this method can actually be generalized to find outliers in other high dimensional data sets. Um, of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of future work. Um, there'll need to be studies on predictive probabilities and how they work and how they apply to different pieces of data. And of course, there's going to be studies on like discrete variables and doing things with different examples. 
However, I was able to find a method to analyze all of this data without being subject to that curse of dimensionality that I talked about earlier. And if we can do that, um, it could lead us to so many new breakthroughs in other fields, including drug discovery, um, natural disaster prediction, and, 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 and even financial data. So we can find new, um, new information that we didn't already know, and that's what really leads us to new scientific knowledge but that becomes so, so important. So I'd like to thank, um, first of all, my mentor, Dr. Vikash Mansinka, um, Mr. Marco Kusumano Towners, who really, really helped me um, so much in understanding, um, in understanding this project and learning so much about probabilistic modeling. Uh, Dr. Jenny Sandova, my tutor, um, who helped me encounter, uh, get through some of the difficulties that were really, really, um, that I encountered during research. Um, of course, the last week and first week TAs, um, uh, my sponsors, the MYSF, the Australian Science Organization, and um, John Shen, who reviewed the paper, RSI, CE, and MIT for all their support in this incredible and amazing program. Thank you. Thanks very much. Questions from the judges? Um, can you say a little bit more about how you're able to distinguish between data entry errors and true outliers using your predictive probabilities? Sure. So essentially, what predictive probability does is it says, what is the probability that some piece of data actually occurs under, um, un under the model? And my intuition for this was essentially uh, saying that if I have something that uh, just slightly deviates due to noise, the predictive probability will be less than just a normal, regular data point. Now, imagine if um, it, it differed for some like, actual explanation. For example, it was an inclined orbit, um, and it was like a communication satellite that was deliberately exhibiting that orbit. It would, that predictive probability would become even less, um, because it wasn't just noise. It's also that additional reason. Now, what happens if it's a data entry error? Then things differ by orders of magnitude. Not, um, not just like slight errors of maybe five, um, clo close to five or 10%. They differ by huge numbers. And that means the predictive probability is going to go down. Um, and so that's how I really was able to use those predictive probabilities to distinguish between a data entry error, a true outlier, and um, something that was just noise. So, sorry, quick follow-up question. So, do you kind of need a human to do that, to say, okay, this is a little weird, that's an outlier, that's really weird, you need to get your decimal places in the right place? Exactly, um, and that was part of my future work. So, um, I outlined in my future work that we need some human to determine what this cutoff actually is. And figuring out some kind of model that can, figure, that can uh, essentially judge where to put this cutoff is definitely a subject for future work. Thank you. Uh, on your graph that you just passed by, you had the really nice match of your data to the, Kepler, to the Kepler curve, but you had a bunch of points at the bottom, and I was wondering, were those your outliers or something else going on with those? Ah, uh, yes, so these were data entry errors, so things that, um, like I said, differed by almost orders of magnitude from the actual results, um, and, for those out, uh, and for those outliers, we can see that they just don't follow the, tr the trend at all, and my model just classed them in a completely separate category, just to say, like, these are completely different from anything that we've ever seen before. Other questions from the judges? Any audience questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned you were using distance for uh, clustering, but then you showed that in high dimensions, distance is basically meaningless, which I clearly agree with. Have you tried densities instead of distance? This is an interesting question. So the question was, um, have I tried using densities instead of distances? Um, so I have I've read some papers on um, how they've tried to use densities instead of um, instead of distances, and densities have have sometimes worked and they've sometimes not worked. So sometimes densities um, really work in certain data. But there's, there, can be, there can be some particular and um, nasty problems associated with them. So I can give you an example right now. Um, imagine that there was a satellite, and it had a certain uh, perigee and, and, and apogee, and, these, and it was part of a group of satellites that all had inclined orbits. Now imagine that there was a new satellite, but it didn't have an inclined orbit, 
and it had the same perigene apogee. Now, the problem with these machine learning algorithms is that they'd immediately go, OK, this has the same perigene apogee. It's got to be an inclined orbit. But, um, um, and and that, th those are kind of the things that um, densities uh, wouldn't be so good on, especially when data is kind of all clumped together. But um, they do work in, in a lot of cases, especially when data can be spread out in some ways. again. Um, this is the distance between the point and nearest neighbor sets as it is in the slide. Yes. Or is the distance between the point and predicted trend? No, no, no. The nearest neighbors. Nearest neighbors. The first one. So if your outlier is the, in a sparse space, you would have more problems. Yes. So in the sparse space, um, the distances between each point and its nearest neighbors are actually quite close to um, the distance between every other point and its nearest neighbors. So, for example, the outlier, uh, um, the point B, has distances between uh, those three outliers over there, and that's actually quite close to that X up the top there and its distances. So, um, because of that, you could, if, if if you said that B was an outlier, you could also say that that top X was an outlier too. So, um, in, in, and, and even that, that, that x on the right. So essentially, every point starts becoming outlierish just because they have very similar distances. Thank you. Okay, thanks again. Thank you so much.